I was sitting in my office at about 10.30 in the morning, preparing for my upcoming class at 11 when the phone rang. It was a former student calling up, telling me to say thank you for the training that I and my training partner Becky Swanson had given him to, given, given to him. He also then started giving me a long list of other people that he wanted me to say thank you to. And it dawned on me, based on what he was saying, he wasn't calling to say thank you, he was calling to say goodbye. He then told me that he had a religious experience and he wanted to share it with me and I said, okay, go ahead. Instead of sharing the experience with me, he told me that he hadn't slept or eaten in the last three days and I knew he was in trouble. I asked him where he was at and he named a city which is about two and a half hours away from where I live. It just happened to be the town that I was born and raised in. So he continued to talk. I took out my cell phone and I dialed the number, which fortunately I remembered after 30 years. Got on the phone with the dispatcher and advised him that I had a potentially suicidal male somewhere in the jurisdiction. I was going to try and get the information to get him to help. We continued to talk. And as we continued to talk, I asked him, you know, where are you at? He said, well, I don't know what the street is. I can't see the street signs. I said, well, Describe it to me. He said, I'm in the parking lot of a church. He said, describe the church to me. So it's large, it's brick, and it's brown. I said, is that on the main drag? He said, yeah. He said, there's a stop right there, and if you take a right, it'll take you down to the college? He said, yes. I knew where he's at. So with my phone, my hand over the receiver of the phone, talking to the dispatcher, trying to cover up the phone when I talked to dispatch so he wouldn't hang up because he knew I called the police and trying to listen to him to make sure that he knew that I was there with him. At the same time trying to answer the questions that the dispatcher had, we continued our conversation and I figured out where he was at and let them know. And as we continued to talk, the dispatcher advised me that the officers would be there soon. I told him when the officers get there uh, that I want you to do what they tell you to to do, and he said that he would. And prior to that, I'd asked him, I said, what is it that you need me to do for you? And he said, I need help. And I told him, brother, I got you. Help us on the way. Stay on the line with me, brother. I got you. He told me on the phone that the police were there, and I took the phone away from my ear because I was pretty sure that he'd use me to get the police there so they'd be there when he took his own life. The good news is that there wasn't a gunshot. He said thank you and he hung up the phone. The dispatcher said thank you and she hung up the phone. <coughs> and I very easily that day could have let that phone call go to voicemail because I was busy. When he called me and I found out what he wanted to talk about, I very easily could have told him, listen, you know, I appreciate the phone call, but I've got to get ready for class here. Thanks so much for calling and let the call go, but there was something in the tone of his voice, something that he said. We need to be willing to take the call. And he never made any overt threats to his own safety, and it was a risk on my part to call a police department two and a half hours away that didn't have the vaguest idea who I was to tell them that I had a guy who I thought was potentially suicidal, and I was basing it on nothing more than my own gut instinct, my own training and having dealt with people in that position in the past. And some people might not have made that phone call. We need to be willing to make that call. About a year later, he got in contact with me, asked me to call him, so I did. He said that he got into the doctor, he'd been diagnosed, he'd gotten on the medication that he needed to be on and that things were a whole lot better. We continued our conversations, we got the clothes, I said, listen, I got one last question for you. He said, what? I said, out of all the people in the world, why did you call me? He said, because I read your article and I thought you'd understand. A few years earlier, my coach and mentor, Coach Bob Lindsay, had asked me to consider writing an article on suicide prevention using the concepts that I had learned in Below 100. I'd written a series of articles, Port Police One, on Below 100 about slowing down, wearing your seatbelt, wearing your vest, remember that complacency kills and remembering what's important now. And I told Coach that I would, since suicide was the number one killer for police officers. And I waited a while for my wife to leave the house to go shopping, and I sat down. 
and I wrote the article. And it didn't take long because the article had written itself back in 1985. The night I sat down with a 357 Magnum and I put it to my head and I cocked the hammer and I put my finger on the trigger. All my hopes and dreams were gone. All I had left was an ultimatum. Give me one good reason I shouldn't blow my fucking brains out right now. And the answer came. There's always tomorrow. I've always been a procrastinator. And I'd love to tell you that I sent the article in right away, but I didn't. Coach would ask me, you working on the article? I'd say, yo, Coach, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Weeks turned into months. And the reason that I didn't tell him that I'd finished the article was very simple. I was afraid. I was afraid if I sent that article out what people would think, what people would say. And I had to have a conversation with myself over those months. And I finally came to the conclusion that if I was going to write an article asking for the culture of law enforcement to change their attitude toward officers who are suffering psychological crisis, then I needed to be willing to tell my own story. So one Saturday, after my wife went shopping, I sent the article to Coach. About 20 minutes later, the phone rang, and it was Coach. He said, Duane, you need to put this article out. It could save lives. And I told him I would. I lied to him. Because up until then, I don't really ever told that story to one person. And there was one more person that I had to tell it to. My wife. And I was afraid. I was afraid it would change how she saw me as a husband. I was afraid it would change how she saw me as a man. I was afraid she would change how she saw me as a friend. So a couple weeks later, we sat down, and I read the article to her. We had a very emotional conversation. And at the end, she said, Dwayne, you need to put this article out. It could save lives. So with her sitting at my side, I took a story that I'd only ever told two people, and I hit the send button, potentially to go out to a quarter million police officers from around the world. And I can tell you, between the time that I hit that send button and the time that the article came out, I had the phone in my hand on a number of occasions with the phone ringing as I called my editor telling him to pull the story because I was afraid of what people would think and I was afraid of what people would say. Well, that night scared the hell out of me. And I decided that I needed to make some major changes in my life. One of the first things that I decided I needed to do so I needed to start to stop living up to the stereotype of what I thought it was to be a man at age 25 because it wasn't working for me. It had cost me friends and it cost me relationships. And the other thing that I decided to do is if I ever got in a relationship, that I'd make sure that I did a much better job of communicating, that I would listen better. If I had something on my mind, I would talk about it versus hoping it would change on its own. And it's a good thing that I did because a couple months later, I met a beautiful young woman. We fell in love. A couple years later, we got married. In a few months, we're going to celebrate 30 years. If you wait, things will get better. If you wait, things will work out. So as I prepared for this talk, I had to ask myself, is there some things that I could take from my personal story that could then apply to the law enforcement profession? And I asked myself, I wonder what would happen if today every police officer went to one other cop and said, listen, this stereotype, try to be a cop where we don't feel anything and we don't say anything and everything's okay, it ain't working, never has worked for anybody. From time to time, I'm going to need to talk to somebody, somebody I trust, that person is you. Would you be willing to take the call? And in return, I'll do the same for you. And by the same token, I want you to hold me accountable. If you see me headed off in the wrong direction, I want you to have a courageous conversation with me. If you see me headed off endangering myself by being unsafe, doing something that's going to damage my career, I want you to say stop. And I want you to tell me to fix it. And if it ever gets so bad that I won't listen to you or the danger is ever so great that if I'm looking like I'm ready to step off the cliff, you have my permission to go over my head talk to my sergeant, talk to my spouse, do an intervention, 
whatever it is that you need to do in order to keep me safe? Are you willing to make the call? And I asked myself, I wonder what would happen if every sergeant went into work today with the attitude that their number one responsibility was the health and the wellness of the officers that they serve. What would happen in this profession if every sergeant was trained in understanding the physiological effects of stress? So when their officers went through a call, the first thing that the sergeant would do would be to sit down with that officer, check to see how they're doing, review with them the process they have to go through, what's going to happen because of stress, and the processes that they need to take in order to have effective coping skills, and then to keep an eye on those officers looking for behavioral changes in the future. And if they saw them, or the officer said that they needed help, getting the help that they need to them quickly. And I wonder what would happen if every chief of police woke up and decided that from now on, my number one priority, my number one asset on my department are the men and women that I serve. And I need to get these processes and these procedures in place in order to keep my officers safe. I wonder how many lives would be saved. I wonder how many marriages would be saved. I wonder how many careers would be saved. I wonder how many families would be saved. And I wondered what would happen if every cop would ever found themselves in my position. What would happen if they were to stand up and tell their story? I'd have to imagine that the chiefs and the sheriffs and the politicians and the administrators and everybody else would be shocked by the numbers of officers who stood and told their story because they found themselves in the position I found myself in. I would hope that, that shock would motivate them to pass legislation, programs, procedures, and policies in order to take care of officers in a much better way than we're doing now when it comes to psychological trauma. And I'd have to imagine that the other officers, seeing all the other officers stand and tell their story, would say to themselves, I don't want to end up there. What do I need to do to keep me from being in that place? And I know that the officers standing and telling their stories and hearing the other officers stand and tell their stories would realize two things. Number one, I am not alone, and it's OK not to be OK. I want you to imagine a conversation. Two squad cars pulled up next to each other, window to window in a parking lot same place like we do. And the conversation goes something like this. So, did you hear what happened to 182? What, you mean the pursuit, the crash? Yeah, I was there. I was in the car with him. That's old news. No, 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 no. You didn't hear the rest of the story? No. What? He broke his leg. What do you mean he broke his leg? I was in the car with him. The crash had been bad enough to break a leg. I would have broke my leg. He was up. He was walking. He was talking. He was fine. What are you talking about? How do you know he broke his leg? His wife made him go to the doctor. His wife made him go to the doctor? Oh, man. Back in my day, you broke your leg, you just walked it off. You had a problem with it, you went out, your buddies got you drunk. You go walk, tell anybody you broke your leg? You just dealt with it. I don't know what's going on with this new generation of cops. Well, how long is he going to be out? We're already shorthanded. I don't know, you know, doctor put a cast on it, you know, gave him the crutches. Going to have to heal. Going to have to go to physical therapy. I'm not sure how long it's going to be. Yeah. I don't know if I want to partner with him anymore. I mean, I don't have x-ray vision. How do I know his leg's really healed? I don't know. We're going to be out in some serious call some night and snap. There goes his leg, and he's laying on the floor in a fetal position. And now I've got to take care of the situation and try and deal with him. How do you know if, they're really, if he's really going to be healed to come back to work? And we all know how ridiculous that conversation sounds and how ludicrous it is. But if we take that from physical trauma of a broken leg and we switch it <coughs> to psychological trauma, how many of us have had those same typical conversations? How many of us have had those same typical thoughts? When we can get in our profession to the point where we treat and deal with officers who have suffered psychological trauma in the same way that we deal with officers who have suffered physical trauma, then we'll be where we need to be in this profession. Last year, 57,180 police officers were assaulted. Of them, 29.8% were injured. My question is this, how many of those officers, officers suffered psychological trauma? And the answer is, we don't know. Why? Because all too often, it's not even a consideration. All too often, it's not even given a thought. And those are just the officers who were assaulted. What about all the other officers 
who experience some type of psychic or psychological trauma because of the things that we're asked to do, see, touch, smell, and hear. What I want you to think about is this. You may be sitting in your seat thinking, well, you know, I don't work on that department, and those changes ain't going to take place today, and that ain't my sergeant, and that ain't my chief, and that's not the culture of where I come from. Well, I got bad news for you. You could be working for the Utopia Police Department, where all those procedures and policies and cultures in place isn't going to do you a darn bit of good until you ask for help. And if you're not in an apartment that has all those procedures in place, guess what? You might have to go get treatment for yourself. And it may cost you money. But let me ask you this. How much does a, does a divorce cost? How much does the failure of a career cost? How much is your life worth? How much is your family worth? You have to be a willing participant in your own self-rescue. John Marx has just wrote a book called Armor Yourself. And in this book, what he does is he put the whole thing together, designed to encompass and allow officers procedures exercises, tips, tactics for maintaining their wellness, mental, physical, spiritual, and physical. And as far as I know, it's the only text of its kind, and I strongly recommend it for each one of you to take a look at it. I wish that I'd had this book when I started my career. I refer to it as the owner's manual of a strong and healthy police career, followed by a strong and healthy police retirement. And if I was Oprah, I would say, look under your seat right now, and you will find a free copy. <laughs> but I'm not Oprah. And you need to take and be a part of your own self-rescue. And I strongly suggest that you purchase the book. Now, I've stood up here today, and I've asked you to think about a lot of things, and I've asked you to do some things, and I've asked you to do those things today. And if you can't do those things today, remember this. There's always tomorrow. Thank you.